Uh, welcome to the final Eagle Talk of the fall 2023 semester. Um, it's the Eagle Talk on justice. Uh, our speaker this morning is Dr. Marshall, well, Marshall King. He's ABD. I'll talk about it in a second. Um, Marshall King joined the faculty of Carson Newman in 2021, having served previously as the coordinator for undergraduate research assistance at the University of Notre Dame's Advanced Institute. In 2016, he was awarded the Foreign Language and Area Studies Fellowship of the U.S. State Department for Advanced Study in Modern Hebrew at Yale University. He's also been a doctoral resident at the National Humanities Center in 2020, as well as a fellow with the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Program, Humanities Without Walls, in 2021. He teaches primarily New Testament courses with an academic interest in the Pauline letters and Hebrews, as well as literary theory, patristics, and digital humanities. Beginning this academic year, he has inaugurated an academic minor in the study of archaeology, drawing on his academic and professional training in archaeology, where he has excavated in Cyprus and Israel. He is married to Sarah, who is a lead teacher at our area Head Start, and together they have two children, Rosalie, who is eight, and Marshall, who is seven. He has a BA in Christian ministry from uh, Crichton College, an MA in archaeology from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, an MA in religion from Yale Divinity School, and he is in ABD status for his PhD from the University of Notre Dame in Christianity and Judaism in Antiquity. Please welcome Marshall King. Now I've got my phone out so I can keep track of time because I know you all would rather it be the case that this is a short lecture uh, so that you have more time on the other side of it than uh, having to sit here for the long haul and listen to me read a, uh, a delivered um, or a prepackaged talk on justice. Um, I'm, I'm very thankful to have had the invitation from uh, Dr. Sotow, Sotow and uh, Dr. Buckner. And uh, it's my intentions in this, this talk on justice to lay out some aspects of justice that I think somewhat go unrecognized as being a part of our conversation or discourse on justice. In fact, let me begin by pointing out that if, if we were at the University of Notre Dame right now, many of you would be getting ready for something called Gary Fest. If you know anything about uh, the geography of Indiana, you're aware that um, Close to Chicago, you have a city called Gary, Indiana. And that's, of course, the home of the Jackson Five, of Michael Jackson and Tito Jackson and uh, Janet Jackson and the others, lesser known Jacksons. So you would think that Jackson Five uh, would be the premise behind Gary Fest, but it's not. It's actually a festival that's being held in a couple of weeks in honor of uh, Dr. Gary Anderson, who is a professor of Old Testament at the University of Notre Dame. And uh, no doubt Gary Fest will honor uh, Professor Anderson by talking about his legacy in the study of the Old Testament. And now he's published books on Genesis and with Yale University Press, he put out a book on uh, grief and um, on sin and charity. And uh, he's written recently on questions of Christian doctrine. He was one of my professors and he gave me uh, a nickname that has stuck over the years, Hamelik. And Hamelik is the Hebrew word for the king. And um, what I want to do in this lecture is to honor Gary, just as uh, the University of Notre Dame is honoring him, and to bring a little bit of Gary Fest to Carson Newman here in East Tennessee. And so one of the things about Gary Anderson, beyond his interest in Genesis and beyond his interest in charity and sin and those types of complex topics, is actually the show Breaking Bad. Now, it's my hope you all know that show. In fact, I can come to an audience uh, of college students and reasonably expect that you all know the show Breaking Bad because it's one of the most watched television shows on Netflix. And when it was on television, it was one of the most watched TV shows in human history. And so Gary's interest in Breaking Bad is an academic one, one about Christian anthropology, the meaning of life and the power of sin in our lives. We don't have enough time today to talk about all those aspects. But here's what I wanna do. Today's Eagle Talk will be at the intersection of the Breaking Bad universe, the topic of justice, and the Christian faith. And I've gathered these reflections in honor of Professor Anderson. Now in looking at justice, I want to explore three aspects of justice 
righting wrongs. That's what we mean by defining justice for this lecture. Justice is righting wrong things. Those three aspects of justice are vengeance, rehabilitation, and reconciliation. We'll map these three aspects onto the three Breaking Bad universe shows. There's Breaking Bad, the TV series that explores the moral decay of a high school chemistry teacher as uh, he discovers he's got terminal cancer and decides that he'll turn to drug manufacturing to provide a nest egg for his family. Then uh, there's the TV show or the, t the movie that is the spinoff on Netflix called El Camino, which is uh, the narration of his former student and partner in crime, Jesse Pinkman, as he escapes um, enslavement from a rival drug gang. And finally, the third um, bit of uh, show from the Breaking Bad universe is Better Call Saul, which tells the story of the corrupt attorney, Saul Goodman. Let's first turn to Breaking Bad. And just for a moment, now listen, I know you got your phones out and none of you want to be here, but please listen to this premise. You discover that you're dying. You've been told you have a terminal illness. College doesn't matter anymore. Midterms no longer matter. What's your job and, and whether or not you're going to get uh, this paycheck or this raise or, or what have you no longer matters. You've been diagnosed with a terminal illness. Now, for understanding the premise of the show, you have to understand that the main character, the protagonist, Walter White, is a brilliant chemist. We discover in the show that he's founded a technology company, Gray Matter Technologies. He's founded it with his college friend, Elliot. At the time of the establishment of this company, Elliot, or sorry, Walt is engaged to Gretchen, who's a lab assistant. Now, for some inexplicable reason, Walt leaves Gretchen and he sells his share of gray matter technologies to his partner, Elliot, for $5,000. Elliot will go on to marry Gretchen, and together, Elliot and Gretchen will grow gray matter technologies into a multi-billion dollar industry. And despite being the co-founder of the company, Walt is entitled to zero profits and watches as his former fiance and best friend live a life of luxury, fame, and dignity that should have included him. Now, Walt eventually does marry. He finds a hostess at a restaurant and falls in love with her, and her name is Skyler, and they settle in Albuquerque where they have a son, Walt Jr. Walt Jr. has cerebral palsy, and Walt eventually becomes the world's most overqualified high school chemistry teacher. Without enough money to even live on, Walt's forced to take a second job as a car wash technician at the age of 50. He works alongside his own students, and he's even forced to wash the cars of students. Around this time, his wife, Skyler, informs him that she's pregnant. Late in life, any hopes of retirement have dwindled to zero. Now, one day at the car wash, Walt passes out from a violent coughing spell that, he, that would not let him alone. He wakes up in the hospital and is diagnosed with terminal cancer. Let Walt frame the dilemma of his life. Doctor, my wife is seven months pregnant without a baby we did, with a baby we didn't intend. My 15-year-old son has cerebral palsy. I'm an extremely overqualified high school chemistry teacher. When I can work, I make $43,700 per year. I have watched all of my colleagues and friends surpass me in every way imaginable. And within 18 months, I will be dead. Walt's life is filled with what I would consider a type of injustice, not the type we would point to in a legal system or in society at large, but on the personal level, the level of a Job. We ask, why do bad things happen to good people? Because we recognize the injustice of things. We see it as unjust that the wrongdoers go awarded while the do-gooders are punished. We recognize that Job suffers a series of injustices as he's stripped of his children, his property, his money, his wealth, and his health. After calamity befalls Job, all he's left with are the talkative-type friends eager to opine on his misery. 
Walt's story, of course, isn't the tale of a Job-like man who lives out the remainder of his life listening to his friends talk to him about why bad things happen. Walt's too proud to accept the wisdom or the help of his family and friends in dealing with how his life has developed. Frustrated by the disappointment of a failed life and motivated by the impulse to secure a future economic freedom for his family after he dies, Walt applies his skills in chemistry to creating methamphetamine. He tracks down a former student, Jesse Pinkman, and before long, Walt and Jesse are producing enormous amounts of drugs. The plan's simple. Make drugs, sell them, save the money for the family for when, he, when I die. In a poignant scene, Walt calculates that he would need to leave $737,000 for his family. That money, as he counts it out, would provide for the mortgage. It would pay for a car for Walt Jr. plus the insurance and gas. It would pay for decades of living costs and all the things associated with having a home and needing to eat. College for two kids, a down payment for homes for them, and a wedding for his daughter, who's just an infant, or nearly an infant, not yet born. Walt only thinks of his life in terms of economic value, not the value he has as a spouse, a father, or a friend. Things don't go according to plan, otherwise you wouldn't have a TV series that lasted more than a season, right? Things don't go according to plan. Walt outlives his prognosis. He becomes entangled with the seedy underworld of Albuquerque, and he reveals, and it reveals his deeply immoral character, which is capable of lying, stealing, infidelity, cheating, and murder. By the conclusion of the series, Walt's decision to correct the wrongs done to him in life by, quote, breaking bad, results in the murder of his righteous brother-in-law, Hank, by, the, by a rival drug gang, the loss of his home to RICO charges, the utter impoverishment of his family and the enslavement of his partner and former student Jesse Pinkman to the same rival gang that shot his brother-in-law. Walt escapes to Vermont to avoid capture by the federal agents who begin to hunt him after his identity is revealed. In the end, no one would mourn Walt's death from cancer. Walt had become a cancer to his family through his inability to morally address the injustices of his life. So far, we've only mentioned injustice, and by that term, here's what we have meant. Injustice is an undeserved wrong. It is the wrong thing happening to the wrong person. In a falling, fallen world, justice exists as a correction of injustice. It is a correction of wrong. It is the right thing happening to the right person for the right reason. Breaking bad provides us a view of justice, but not until the end. And not the, type of, not the type of justice we Christians endorse as justice for us to wield. That rival gang who has imprisoned Jesse Pinkman and had killed are evil. They're wicked, horrible people deserving wrath against them. In the end, it appears, though, that they have won. The unjust are awarded with un innumerable riches and happiness. Just as Elliot and Gretchen enjoy the prophets of Walt's genius, so too does the rival gang reap the harvest of fields they did not sow. And here's where the form of justice enters. Walt returns from Vermont. He returns from hiding to bring a violent reckoning upon his rivals. He succeeds in gunning them down, murdering all of them. And he secured the freedom of Jesse Pinkman and died in the process. We cannot here ask whether Walt's redemption is meant by his final actions, but we can now provide justice according to Breaking Bad. It is righting the wrongs through violence, which we call vengeance. Vengeance, I would say, is the greatest satisfaction of justice. That is the reason Quentin Tarantino's movies leave us fulfilled. We see Hitler in an entire theater of Nazis caught in a conflagration. We see Charlie Manson and his goons eradicated before they can commit the barbarous crimes in Hollywood. We see the bride bring Bill to his fateful end, and we see Django blow up the Candyland plantation. At the end of each of Tarantino's movies is a recognition that the world we live in is unjust, which is why we go to the movies where we can see the injustices of this world reversed through the magic of film. 
No matter how satisfying scratching our unjust itches with the claws of vengeance, correcting injustices of this world through violence is out of bounds. We cannot bring about justice through violence because vengeance does not belong to us. It belongs to God, which we discover in the Song of Moses of Deuteronomy 32, where Moses explains, quoting God's utterance, vengeance is mine and retribution. This teaching that vengeance belongs to God underpins Paul's exhortation to the Romans. When you get into chapter 12, he begins his, his exhortation on ethics, where he says to the Romans, which abides for us all, never take on your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The author of Hebrews uses the exact same quotation from Deuteronomy, but to drive home a different point, not about our reserving vengeance for God, but to point out that the vengeance of God is a terrible thing. Hebrews 10.31, the author reminds us, it is terrifying, this is a quote, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God, end quote. Before passing on to rehabilitation and on to reconciliation, it should be noted that Walt could have leaned on his family and friends to enjoy what little life he had assumed to be left. Elliot and Gretchen are eager to pay for his medical treatment and other expenses he may have. And Schuyler is supportive, loving, and active in assisting, as he, assisting him as he navigates his doctor appointments. Walt Jr. is ready to take on a job and fundraise for his father. His sister and brother-in-law, Mary and Hank, are completely supportive of him. When we read Job, we are often preoccupied with pointing out that the book uses Job's friends to present particular views as to why Job is suffering. That is the best way to understand the book. But the struggle to acquire wisdom preoccupies Job from his misery. His friends, as wrong as some may be, nonetheless provide conversation and their presence keep, that keeps him from continuing to mire in that slough of despondency. That could have been Walt. Walt could have responded to the injustices of his life with the gifts of friends and family and conversation. Let me provide one last point as we wrap up Walt. It's another contrasting point. Many of you are probably aware of the show House, about Gregory House, who's a grump man with a cane, and I've, for a long time, have been a grumpy man with a cane, but I've dispensed with my cane. It's the story of uh, Gregory House, who works at Plain Princeton Plainsboro Hospital. He's a, he's a differential diagnosis doctor, and he's best friends with the oncologist on staff, whose name is Wilson. Wilson spends his life uh, treating cancer, and in the end, he discovers that he has terminal cancer, just like Walt. Had, had discovered. The series ends, however, not with Wilson doing something outrageous to try to correct the injustices of his diagnosis. It ends with friendship. It ends with Wilson and Gregory House riding off together into the countryside on their Harley Davidsons. Friendship is the right response to injustice. Just ask Frodo Baggins whether our burdens are bearable, are bearable apart from friendship. I want to turn briefly to the two spinoffs to speak about other aspects of justice, rehabilitation and reconciliation. We've looked at vengeance as using violence to right the wrongs of our lives. We'll now examine rehabilitation and reconciliations as forms of righting wrongs. And remember, that's the definition that we've put forward. Whereas Breaking Bad ends with Walt having died and Jesse escaping the place he was enslaved and imprisoned, the Netflix movie, El Camino, continues Jesse's story. For Walt, injustice took the ultimate form of cancer, and justice the ultimate form of vengeance. With Jesse, the injustice is trauma, and the justice is rehabilitation. Jesse has a kindness about him. He cares for his grandmother during her cancer treatment, and he displays a loyalty of the utmost to his friends. He's brave, considerate. He's ultimately a victim of Walt's. He falls in love with a girl whom Walt refuses to save from death. He carries the memory of her forever. He falls in love again eventually only to have that woman killed by the rival gang right in front of him. And that same rival gang imprisons him, beats him, tortures him, and abuses him, and forces him to cook crystal meth for them. 
We see Jesse's living conditions and maltreatment. We see his PTSD. We see him reeling from memories. We see a man who is broken by the trauma of drugs, loss, abandonment, and violence. In his story, El Camino, there is a moment where he has an opportunity to do as his former teacher, and he always in the show refers to his teacher as Mr. White. He never dispenses with the formality. He's, uh, Walter's last name is White, and so he always refers to him as Mr. White. He has an opportunity to follow through with Mr. White's lesson, which is vengeance wins the day. He has an opportunity to seek vengeance against the men who hurt him. In this case, those who welded the metal prison and the harnesses that were designed to imprison him, who also had taunted and harassed him. Unlike Walt, Jesse refuses to internalize a system of injustice that threatens to destroy him. Now listen, I don't want to lose you here, so let me be clear about what I mean. We are told to be mindful of the battles we fight as to protect ourselves from becoming like our enemies. Walt becomes cancer on his family in his fight with cancer, and Jesse risks becoming the very thing he is fighting, anger, misanthropy, and abuse. The remedy is course correction, to avoid dishing out what others have given to turn the other cheek, not in the sense of foregoing self-defense, but in the sense of not hitting back just to get even. When the opportunity emerges, Jesse corrects the chain of aggression by showing mercy to those who hurt him, he lets them go. Jesse's trauma had imprisoned him physically and metaphorically, but his course correction, that is, his refusal to do what others had done to him, rehabilitated him. Rehabilitation is making things right through stopping the wrong. In many ways, Jesse reminds me of the Apostle Peter, who found himself living with the despair of having betrayed Christ three times during Jesus' arrests and trials. To live with the trauma of betraying Christ would be far heavier than I could imagine. But the love Christ has for Peter and for all of us is a love defined by the opportunities he provides us for course correction. In his mercy, Christ provides rehabilitation to Peter. That is, a chance to undo the wrong, to make things right by changing the wrong of his denial with the right of his embracing Christ. That chance for course correction comes when Jesus asks Peter three times in his res after his resurrection whether he loves him. That's John chapter 21. And Peter affirms all three times in a reversal of his denial that he does love Christ. And Christ reinstates Peter and sets him on the road to Rome. As we move from vengeance and rehabilitation, we come to reconciliation. And here our protagonist is Saul Goodman, and he is not a victim of any trauma or illness. We can point to no real injustice in his life that he has responded to. In fact, his descent into sin is more innocuous than the others, but it's all the more comprehensive. To be sure, Saul Goodman is an irredeemable, or at least we think of him as being irredeemable, and totally corrupt. Whenever the criminals of Albuquerque need legal assistance, they come to Saul Goodman. Saul is a criminal attorney, which in the show means that he represents criminals and himself is a criminal. He works closely with both Walt and Jesse to keep the money flowing. In the series Better Call Saul, we discover his backstory, that he was actually named Jimmy McGill, and before becoming a lawyer, he was just a two-bit hustler committing petty crimes. He was the younger brother of a respected attorney, Chuck McGill, who was a partner with the prestigious law firm Hamlin, Hamlin, and McGill. Saul eventually decides to enter law by attending the University of, Amer sorry, the, uh, University of American Samoa Law School, which I just love. I'm almost certain it's not a real law school, but the University of American Samoa Law School. Chuck remains, that's his brother, remains throughout his life unimpressed by his younger brother, Saul. But Saul clearly shows signs of deep concern and affection for his brother. When his brother develops a psychological fear of electricity and lives and his life goes to ruin, Saul demonstrates his devotion and constant care for Chuck. Saul's descent from a loving brother to a corrupt attorney is slow but steady, even before he meets Walt and Jesse. Now his fall is petty je jealousy. He wants nothing more than to have Chuck's affirmation, but Chuck doesn't find a redeemable quality in his brother. 
Chuck's admiration is reserved for the well-disciplined, articulate, careful, and perfectly well-mannered uh, Howard Hamlin. By all accounts, Howard is a righteous man and an excellent attorney whose only fault was becoming entangled in Saul and Chuck's family squabble. As the show progresses, Saul's actions directly lead to the untimely death of his brother in a house fire, following Saul's public embarrassment of him. Saul never takes responsibility and never admits to the wrongdoing against his brother. To help Saul mourn is his wife, Kim Wexler, who's also an attorney. Together, Saul and Kim team up to harass and plague Howard Hamlin. Like Chuck, Hamlin is eventually publicly disgraced. Hamlin is distraught at the ruin of his reputation that he had worked a lifetime to build. He goes to Saul and Kim's apartment inebriated, where he plans to confront them for the harassment. He never had his chance. The show's antagonist, a murdering criminal named Lalo, arrives and kills Hamlin in front of Kim and Saul. And both will survive, but Lalo himself will be killed by one of the show's criminal bosses. The boss has Lalo and Hamlin buried together. It's the most horrific scene on TV I've ever seen. The burial of Hamlin alongside Lalo. It's the things of absolute nightmare. The boss has Lalo and Hamlin buried together. The criminal murderer, Lalo, and the righteous attorney, his victim, Hamlin, right beside each other in an unmarked grave. The guilt of all of it is too immense. Kim leaves Saul, and Saul eventually sets up his own law practice. At this point, you likely think I'm not doing a very good job summarizing the show because it seems unlikely and, and, and out of this world that so much awful could come from just being a nuisance, a bother, or just being a joker. But there's a scene at the end of the show that sheds light on how to best understand Saul's descent to sin. As Kim leaves Saul's new office, having had their divorce papers signed by him, she's caught under the pavilion in a heavy downpour. Under that pavilion is Jesse Pinkman. Now, this is before all the stuff about Walt and Jesse happens. This is, uh, the show takes place as, a, uh, as a, 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 a prequel to the show Breaking Bad. So at this point, Jesse Pinkman is not a bad guy. Under the pavilion is Jesse Pinkman, who recognizes Kim as a person who was the attorney that represented his friend. His friend stole a baby, a baby Jesus from a church nativity scene. Jesse jokes that he never understood why his friend stole the baby Jesus. He had no reason to do it. Jesse could not uh, know then that he was beating the same path that St. Augustine had beaten when he reflected on his young adulthood in the pear tree. St. Augustine describes himself and his friends, which he referred to as ruffians, who saw a pear tree ripe with pears. Listen to Augustine describe his descent into sin. We carried off a huge load of pears, not to eat ourselves, but to dump out to the hogs after barely tasting some of them ourselves. Doing this pleased us all the more because it was so forbidden. And such was my heart, O oh God, and such was my heart, which you pitied even in that bottomless pit. Behold, now let my heart confess to you, God, what it was seeking there with the pear tree when I was being so gratuitously wanton, having no attraction to evil, but the evil itself. It was foul, and I loved it. I loved my own undoing. I loved my error, not that for which I erred, but the error itself, a depraved soul, falling away from security in you to destruction itself, seeking nothing from the shameful deed but shame itself. When Augustine and Jesse after him discover about sin is that sin does not have a recognizable purpose, Saul discovers it too. We tell lies that have no benefit. We steal things we don't need or even want. Saul does not benefit from hurting his brother or Hamlin, but he cannot stop himself. Sin is an itch, and Saul begins to scratch it until he's infected through and through. I want to be clear here. Saul is a bad man who seemed irredeemable. His story is different than Walt's and Jesse's. Whereas Walt faces the injustice of cancer and Jesse the injustice of trauma, Saul faces no injustice. He creates plenty of it. He finds loopholes and procedural issues to help his guilty clients who are criminals stay out of jail. 
He assists Walt in staying out of jail year after year. By any count, Saul is far worse than Walt. Now, after the news breaks that Walter White was a drug manufacturer, Saul escapes from Albuquerque and moves to Nebraska to assume a new identity. He's eventually caught, and it appears that he will spend the remainder of his life behind bars at the worst prison imaginable. Saul proves, however, to be a truly excellent attorney. He dismantles the federal government's case against him through spinning the facts into a perfectly aligned account of his own victimhood. He would have everyone believe that he too was a victim of Walter White, just like everyone else had been. Risking the loss of a conviction, the government attorneys agreed to a plea deal of seven years down from life. Seven years in an okay prison. Seven years that will just go by in a blink of an eye versus spending life in a horrible maximum prison. Hoping to get an even better deal, and if you watch the show, the better deal is he's hoping to have Bluebell ice cream delivered to him on Fridays. In hope of getting that tremendous deal of having Bluebell, he offers information to the prosecutors about the whereabouts of Hamlin's body. But he's informed that Kim Wexler already has made a police report some time ago, and so his information is not valuable. Now, on the way to the arraignment, Saul suggests that he has some more information that would be valuable concerning Kim. And so the idea is he's going to turn on Kim and maybe find a way to get Kim implicated in his crimes, even though she's guiltless. When he arrives to the courthouse, he sees Kim has been brought in to listen to the arraignment. He had not seen her in over a decade since their divorce. And the judge is beside herself with the details of the plea deal, explaining that he has gotten the best deal of any criminal she had ever seen, which reinforces the characterization that Saul was an excellent attorney, if he even was a criminal attorney. At that moment, when the judge asks him how is it he's getting this wonderful sweetheart deal, Saul begins to speak. And when he speaks, you think he's going to give the same spiel that he gave the federal prosecutors. And he's going to get off on seven years. And maybe he's going to add something to sweeten the deal and end up with bluebells on, bluebell ice cream on Friday. So he begins to speak, but he doesn't give the same victim speech. Instead, he gives the full truth about his whole life, from his petty jealousy of Howard Hamlin to his involvement in helping Walter White. He confesses everything in front of everyone and it costs him everything. He goes from seven years with the possibility of perks and special treatment at a minimal security prison to a maximum security imprisonment for the remainder of his life, all due to his confession. His confession means he will spend his life behind bars, but it rights the wrongs of his life. His confession brings him reconciliation with Kim, his brother, Howard Hamlin's widow, Hank's widow, and all those he had harmed. His confession is in keeping with Christ's own commandment concerning murder. This is Christ speaking in Matthew's gospel. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not murder. And whoever commits murder shall be answerable to the court. But I say to you, anyone who is angry with his brother shall be answerable to the court. And anyone who says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be answerable to the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough even to go into fiery hell. Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar, and there at the altar you remember your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go First be reconciled to your brother, and then come present your offering. Come to good terms with your accuser quickly while you're with him on the way to court so that your accuser will not hand you over to the judge and the judge over to the bailiff, and the bailiff will throw you into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of prison until you pay the last penny. Paying the price cannot always bring about justice. Bringing our sacrifice to the altar to gain expiation of sin does not provide justice to those we have hurt. Let me say that one more time. 
bringing our sacrifice to the altar to gain forgiveness of sin does not provide justice to those we have hurt. Saul's imprisonment is the right thing, but it cannot bring about any sort of real justice, not for Saul and not for those he has hurt. Reconciliation isn't presenting a sacrifice. It is confessing to those you have hurt that you have done wrong by them and that you need to make it right. That is what Christ means as he teaches that leaving your sacrifice at the altar to be reconciled to your brother is the more immediate step. Only after you have been reconciled will your sacrifice matter. One last point in wrapping up. Better Call Saul builds on the questions of time and the regrets of life. And towards the end of the show's final season, we discover in flashbacks that Saul has been reading H.G. Wells' time machine. In these flashbacks, he engages with people on if they could go back in time to change their lives, where would they go and what would they do? The point isn't time and changing time. It's that we cannot go back in time to make things better by just reversing what we had done. The premise of Saul's life is that reconciliation amends the wrongs of the past. And in the end, Saul finds himself an agent of reconciliation. This morning, I've presented to you three aspects of justice, and this is just by way of summary. Justice, we said, is righting wrong things. And those three aspects have been vengeance, rehabilitation, and reconciliation. A violent aspect of justice we call vengeance belongs to God. A reformative aspect of of justice we call rehabilitation. And the reparative aspect of justice we call reconciliation. It's my hope that this has been useful to you, useful to your life and also useful, useful to you as you reflect on how we live out our Christian faith in a meaningful way. And we do not do so through wanting to return evil with evil, rather with forgiveness and for course correction.